Okay, so this is the second video in Unit 5. Here we're going to be talking about the gas laws. And so we are going to be, there we go, looking primarily at defining and identifying the gas laws and then performing calculations using those. And specifically here, I'm mentioning the ideal gas law because almost every other one is a derivative of that. So we're going to start with um, the gas laws. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how we can relate the properties to one another. And then we're going to go through the individual gas laws here. Now, guys, there are a whole bunch. Um, there's Boyle's Law, Charles' Law, Gay-Lussac's. Um, this should have a dash. Uh, Avogadro, the ideal gas law. But all of these, Boyle's through Avogadro's, combine into the ideal gas law. And in fact, even the combined gas law is a der derivative of the ideal gas law. And so really, all of these come down to one equation that you really need to know. Um, so we're going to go through it step by step, but then I'm going to give you the shortcut way to remember. Um, and then the last gas law we look at is Dalton's law of partial pressures. So gas behavior allows us to observe what happens in a situation. We're not going to understand how but or the why, but we're going to see what happens. And that is going to allow scientists to really develop ideas and equations to try and explain what happened. So we are going to take what we know about gases, the pressure, the volume, um, the amount, and the temperature, and we're going to relate all of these things together um, through these different laws. Now, the first gas law that we really talk about is Boyle's gas, is Boyle's law. Now, the way I remember this, and it's super cheesy, but it still works. When I was in school, we used to say, oh, you can boil your peas and veggies. And so Boyle's law is the relationship between P and V, P for pressure, V for volume. That is how I remember what Boyle's law talks about. Now, pressure is going to be inversely proportional to volume. Um, this is only going to be true if you hold temperature and the amount of the gas present uh, constant. But think about if you squeeze a water bottle or you squeeze a balloon, you're making that volume go down. And so the pressure inside the gas, um, inside the container, the pressure of the gas inside the container, is going to um, rise. It's because there's less area for it to be in, and so those particles are going to be um, jammed in a little bit more, like down here. And so the pressure goes up as volume goes down. Now, what we can do is hold P and V um, equal to some constant, OK? So we're going to have the equation for Boyle's Law of P1V1 equals P2V2, which really just means the pressure multiplied by the volume at one situation is equal to the pressure times the volume at a new condition. Now, inversely proportional means that if P goes up, V goes down. So really, when we talk about a graph of P versus B, you can kind of kind of see that P versus V over here is curved. The linear graph or the direct relationship would be between pressure and 1 over volume. And that would give us um, the linear relationship. Right. And I totally forgot we have a video for this. So Boyle's Law is something um, along the lines of if you have uh, pressure going up, volume is going to go down, and vice versa. So here they have a balloon inside a vacuum. They are sucking a, v a vacuum, which means that the pressure is going down. And you can actually see the balloon going up. Um, if they release this vacuum, which I think they do in a minute, um, pressure would go back up and volume would shrink back down. 
just like there we go. Now, I've seen a ton of videos on uh, YouTube and through CK12, Boundless, and several other sites. And I have to tell you, some of the coolest ones end up being with the marshmallows, but it's hard to monitor the real volume of the air. And so here we have air inside a marshmallow, because marshmallow is just sugar and air, really. Um, you pull a vacuum, the volume gets bigger, so it expands, um, and then vice versa. So that's kind of what this, these videos show in your lecture. So let's do a Boyle's Law problem. Here we have a balloon that occupies 5.4 liters with a pressure of one atmosphere. If the pressure drops to 0.856 atmospheres, what will the new volume be? Assume the temperature and moles are held constant. So this statement right here tells us that we can use Boyle's Law. Now I usually make a table because I'm always afraid of messing up my information. So I've got my P and my V, condition one, condition two. Oops. So here we have a balloon, Titan, stuff it, that occupies 5.4 liters and has a pressure of 1.04 atmospheres. If the pressure were to suddenly drop to 0 0.856 atmospheres, what would the new volume be? So we're looking for this. Now remember, moles is held constant. It's not that it's got a leak in the balloon. It's more a matter of the pressure itself has changed. Something like maybe on an airplane. If you've ever taken an airplane trip, even though they pressurize the cabin of the plane, it's not really sufficient. And you can kind of watch um, closed bottles of water that you open at the, the I don't know, whatever feet they uh, fly at. You open, take a sip of your water, you close it, and then you land. When you land, what happens, the pressure's gone up, and your little bottle of water is going to look um, completely compressed. So to solve for this, we're going to use Boyle's Law, which we know is P1V1 is equal to P2V2. So we're just going to plug in this information. We have 1.04 atmospheres times 5.4 liters is equal to 0 0.856 atmospheres times our V2. To solve for our V2, we're going to go ahead and divide both sides by the 0 0.856 atmospheres. And in our calculator, we're going to enter 1.04 times 5.04 divided by 5, uh, 0.856. And that's going to give us something like 6.56, or basically 6.6 .6 liters. Atmospheres canceled, so you're left with units of liters. Now, just a quick check to make sure this makes sense. P here went down. V should have gone up. And 6.6 .6 is bigger than 5.4, so it worked. OK, so a gas inside a balloon occupies 325 mils and exerts a pressure of 4.56 atmospheres. If the pressure drops to 2.26 atmospheres, what's the new volume going to be? And again, we're assuming that temperature and moles are held constant. I'd like to encourage you guys to pause here and work the problem yourself. And then when you come back, we can do it together. So the first thing I'm going to do is make my table. I've got my P's and my V's. And we know the first condition is 325 milliliters and 4.56 atmospheres. Pressure drops to 2.26. What's our new volume? So we can see here, P went down, so V should go up. We know that that's what we're expecting. 
let's talk about this milliliters for a second. Does it matter in Boyle's law what our units are? Do I have to use liters or can I use milliliters? Hopefully you can tell that if you, whatever units you have over here, you can have over here. It'll be okay. So we're going to go ahead and plug this in. We have 4.56 atmospheres times 325 milliliters is equal to 2.26 or 2 atmospheres times V2. We're going to divide both sides by this 2.26. That goes away. And it leaves us with a V2 that is equal to 4.56 times 325 divided by 2.26. And we get something like 636 big, six big, three six six. Okay. So we want basically 656 milliliters. Atmospheres cancels here and here, leaves us with atmosphere, uh, milliliters. If you did it in liters, if you had converted first, you would get 0 0.656 liters. Either way is totally going to be fine. The second gas law is Charles's law. Charles's law is, um, the way I remember this is growing up, we used to say all the time, Charlie Brown is on TV. Now, Charles's law holds that if you increase temperature, you're going to also increase volume. The temperature in Kelvin is directly proportional to volume. Now, guys, I will tell you, this is usually when I walk into my class and say, it has to be in Kelvin, and I use my angry mom voice because you have to convert to Kelvin. It will not work if you don't convert to Kelvin. And usually I don't tell them I'm just mad about that. I usually start off with something about why didn't you convert, and then I lead into that. But since I started yelling um, for that one statement, test errors have gone down on those problems. So we're going to keep with that uh, trend. So here we have, um, for Charles's law, it's a direct relationship. So the graph between temperature and volume is linear. Um, notice that this only holds if this is in Kelvin. Um, and it kind of makes sense. You raise the temperature. Volume is going to expand. It's got to, um, these particles are going to move faster the hotter they get. They're going to uh, have to spread out more. Okay? Um, now, the other thing I want to say is you can take the inverse of these, of both sides of this as well, where we can have V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. Either way is acceptable. Um, honestly, when I'm trying to decide which one I want to do, I'm going to put whatever I am solving for on top. So if the temperature asks me for a new volume, I'm going to use this guy. And if it's asking for a new uh, temperature, I'm going to use this one over here. All right, so I have um, two videos for Charles's Law. Um, I will say... Uh, this is the more scientifically accurate and safe one. And the idea here is that Charles's law says as you raise the temperature, you're going to increase the volume. There we go. So you've got a balloon that doesn't quite take up the whole beaker. You put it on boiling water, and it starts to expand so that it now takes up a larger volume. And you can see it no longer just comes out anymore. Now, um, then we have this video over here. This video has so many different um, uh, variations online. I chose this one because I feel like it's probably the least safe, but probably the most dramatic. Um, I should also say, in no way do I ever recommend you doing this at home, ever. Um, 
even in a supervised capacity, is not uh, great. Go away. So what they're doing is they're heating this container with an open valve. So the gas particles that are in here are being uh, really expanded and heated so that they are um, taking up the whole area. Now, then what they're going to do is cap this and turn it over into ice water. So they've basically taken the temperature from very high, uh, not going to watch the unsafe part, and lowered it a lot by adding water and ice to it. Now, what's going to happen is as the temperature goes down, the volume goes down as well. You could used to do this with soda cans pretty well, but I think they've started adding a lining to the cans to reinforce them a little bit. So as a Charles's Law example problem, we have a balloon that occupies 15.4 liters at 25 degrees Celsius. What volume would the gas occupy at 35 degrees Celsius? And again, this statement down here, assuming pressure in moles is constant uh, or held constant, tells us that we can use Charles's Law. So I'm going to go ahead and make my table. A balloon that is at 15.4 liters and 25 degrees Celsius. And then we're going to increase that to 35 degrees Celsius. What do you need to do first? You absolutely must convert this to Kelvin. If you don't, it will not work. So we need 270 add to add 273 to both sides, which is going to give us 308 Kelvin over here and 298 Kelvin here. Now we can plug in. Because I'm looking for my volume, I'm going to put volume on top. V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. So we're going to plug in 15.4 liters over 298 is equal to our new volume over 308. Multiply both sides by 308. And in our calculator, we are going to enter 308 times 15.4. And then we're going to divide that by 298. And that gives us um, 15.9. You can see your Kelvin and Kelvin cancel, so we're left with liters. Now, guys. If we had not changed to Kelvin, if you had left it as Celsius, you would not have gotten the right answer. What you would have had instead is um, something like 21 or 22 liters, I think it comes out to be. And so the, the math only works for Kelvin. So make sure you're changing temperature to Kelvin. There we go. Um, Gay-Lussac's law is going to be uh, the direct relationship between the Kelvin temperature and the pressure. Now, here, the idea is that the higher your temperature, the faster the particles are moving. And if they cannot expand in volume, if volume is held constant, what happens is that faster motion um, gives a higher pressure. So if P goes up, T goes up, or if P goes down, T goes down. Oops. There we go. Now, here is um, a demonstration of Gay-Lussac's law. The idea is they are going to take um, matches and put it into this bottle. Um, whereas normally the, ga the egg does not drop in. Um, when you take matches that are lit and put them into this bottle, it temporarily raises the temperature of the bottle. So you can see the egg doesn't fit in. And then um, if you take 
some matches and light them. It's going to heat up the bottle, which is going to increase the pressure. As the matches go down, the temperature is going to lower, and you can see that the decrease in pressure is going to suck the egg in. So temperature and pressure are, in, are directly proportional. So a gas in a closed container, when you have a fixed volume in moles, exerts a pressure of 8.64 atmospheres at 50 degrees Celsius. What would the temperature be in Celsius if the pressure was suddenly raised to 17.2 atmospheres? So same thing, I'm going to go ahead and make my table. And here we have 8.64 atmospheres and 50 degrees Celsius. And we're going to raise the pressure to 17.2 atmospheres. Now, I will tell you guys, um, remember that we had P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2 here. It's just like with Charles's law. Because we are looking for temperature, we can actually use the inverse of both sides, and it's going to work out fine. Um, so just be aware of that. Now, if you don't change to Kelvin, you're not going to get the right answer. So the first thing I'm going to do is change this to Kelvin. Um, so I'm going to take 273 and add that to 50, and we get 323 Kelvin. Now plugging this in, I'm going to put my T's on top. T1 over P1 is equal to T2 over P2. So we have 323 Kelvin over 8.64 atmospheres. And that's equal to T2 over 17.2 atms. To cancel, we're going to multiply by 17.2 atms. That goes away. And we're left with 17.2 times 323, and then divided by 8.64. And that is going to give us our T2 as 643. Now look, atmospheres cancels. We're left with units of Kelvin. That is not what it is asking us for. It wants it in Celsius. So we're going to take 643 minus 273 to get our Celsius. And that's going to give us something like 370 degrees Celsius. OK? Now, guys, if you had not changed to Kelvin before doing this, you would not have gotten anywhere near this 370 Celsius you would have gotten something like 100. It only works in Kelvin. Avogadro's law is where we talk about, and you know how Avogadro in unit 3 and 4 was all about the moles? Well, he's still about the moles here. Um, this law is specific to gases. He says that, well, I mean, honestly, yeah, we're going to keep it for gases here. Um, volume is directly proportional to moles if pressure and temperature are held constant. And that makes up, I mean, it makes sense. If N goes up, V goes up. You can kind of think about this in terms of house guests, especially if you have like an annoying uncle or a crazy aunt that wants to come stay. Um, I think one of my students in class uh, may have mentioned in-laws even. When the number of particles or the number of people increases, you need more space. And so this totally follows logic. There we go. So here, a 4.15 mole sample of helium occupies a 75 liter balloon. What volume will 3.75 moles occupy at the same temperature and pressure? So we've got N and V, 1 and 2, 4.15 moles at 75 liters. And if it 
decreases to 3.75 moles, what is our new volume going to be? Well, I'm going to go ahead and put my Vs on top because that's what I'm looking for. If you want to leave it as it was on the last slide, that's fine. Um, you also don't have to just multiply both sides by a number. You can cross multiply or however you learned. As long as you're getting the right number, that's all that matters. So here we're going to plug in what we've got. We have 75 divided by 4.15. This is liters. Um, this is moles. And that's equal to V2 over 3.75 moles. <clears throat> to cancel, we're going to multiply both sides by 3.75. Units of moles cancel, and our V2 is 3.75 times 75, and then we can divide by 4.15. And you should get something like 68 liters. Oops. Now we're going to combine all of those gas laws into the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law is just PV equals NRT. Um, I've heard it called PEVNERT before, um, but the idea is PV equals NRT. Now, just to get this on both sides for a second, I'm going to divide both sides by NRT. NRT divided by NRT is just 1. Now look at this, guys. Um, PV. Where does that come from? This one was Boyle's Law. Boil your peas and your vegetables. V and T, I'm going to do this one. TV is because Charlie Brown or Charles's Law, oops, Charles's Law. Then we have um, okay, so we've got Boyles and Charlie Charles's Law. Now we can look at the other two. Um, so we've got V and N over here. This is Avogadro's Law. And then remember that P and T is Gay-Lussac's Law. And so we combine all of these into the ideal gas law. Remember pressure is um, P, V is volume, N is amount, um, and then T is the temperature. Um, now, technically, the gas constant is how we relate these things together, and that comes from the fact that um, there has to be a numerical relationship between these values. Now, because for us, um, the gas constant, and I always give this to you guys on exams, is eight, uh, 0 0.8206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin, we actually will have to use all of these units when we're dealing the ideal gas law. Has to be liters, has to be atmospheres, has to be moles, and has to be Kelvin. Um, otherwise your units aren't going to cancel. So for example, if we wanted to do an ex a problem where we have an <sighs> ideal gas law problem that's going to give you basically everything and then I'm going to give you R somewhere on your exam. Um, so for us, what volume will an 82.6 gram sample of nitrogen gas exerting 7.25 atmospheres at 62.1 degrees Celsius fill? Now, you guys can probably tell this is a much longer problem than I like for exams, um, but you have to start somewhere, right? So here, I'm going to go ahead and make my chart. We have 7.25 ATMs. Our R from the last page was 0 0.08206 
liter atmospheres per moles Kelvin. We have a volume that we're looking for. We have 62.1 degrees Celsius and 82.6 grams of nitrogen. Now, if we go down the line, atmospheres is okay because that's a value that is already in our gas constant. It's going to cancel. Um, grams does not. So we have to convert this to moles. So what we need to do is find the molar mass of nitrogen. There's two nitrogens. Each is 14.01. Gives us 28.01 grams per mole. So we're going to divide by 28.02. So we have 82.6 divided by 28.02. And you should get something like 2.93 moles. And then remember, we actually have to change to Kelvin as well. So this Celsius has to go to Kelvin. So we're going to add 273. And you get something like 335. Now at this point, we can go back to our equation and we can see PV equals NRT. I think it's easier to go ahead and solve for our variable and then plug things in, but that's just me. And so that means that V is equal to NRT divided by P. So we're going to have our N, which is 2.93, times our R. And I'm going to go ahead and write that this is moles, 0 0.08. 206 liter atmospheres per moles Kelvin. And because I'm out of room, I'm going to get rid of this equals and go with my T on this side, 335 Kelvin. And we're going to divide all of this by our pressure in 7.25 atms. Now solving for this, Kelvin cancels over here, moles cancels here, and atmospheres and atmospheres cancel. So we're going to be left with units of liters, which is what we want. So in our calculator, we have 335 times 2.93 times 0 0.08206. And then all of that is going to be divided by 7.25 atmospheres. And you get something like 11.1 or 11.11 liters. Same thing, guys. On an exam, I'm probably only going to have you. Um, now, you may actually end up having to convert one thing, but then it's just going to be plug and chug after that. Now, in addition, remember how we said PV equals NRT, and then we pulled both thing, the, everything to one side so that we had PV over NRT is equal to 1. Well, if PV over NRT is equal to 1, then we can have another PV over NRT, or another set of conditions over here. So 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2. But if you look at this, if I were to cancel R from this side, I'd multiply R over here, and then I'd multiply R over here. So your R's go away. And if we're talking about the same sample of gas, it means that your moles is going to stay the same too. So your moles cancels. This leaves you with what's called the combined gas law. You have P1V1 over T1 is equal to P2V2 over T2. So for example, a sample of helium at 37 degrees Celsius, 15.1 atmospheres in a 2,425 milliliter container.
If the temperature is suddenly cooled to 20.1 degrees Celsius and the volume adjusts to 18.15 milliliters, what will the new pressure be? Well, just like always, I'm going to go ahead and make my table, P, V, and T. So we've got 15.1 atmospheres with 24, 25 milliliters and 37 degrees Celsius. Second set of conditions, we have 20.1 degrees Celsius, 1815 milliliters, and we're looking for a new pressure. Milliliters and milliliters. You can leave it or not. It's not going to affect anything um, because it's going to cancel. Um, there's no R value. You have the same on both sides. It's going to be okay. Not the case for your Kelvin. So we have to change both of these temperatures to Kelvin. So this gives us 293 Kelvin on this side. And then 273 plus 37 gives us a nice um, 310 Kelvin over here. So we've got P1V1 over T1 is equal to P2V2 over T2. I'm going to go ahead and solve for my P2 now by multiplying both sides by T2 and dividing both sides by my V2. If you want, you can plug in all the numbers first, guys. I just think it's shorter this way. So that's going to give us our second temperature, 293, times our first pressure, 15.1, times our first volume, 2,425 milliliters, or 2.425 liters either way. And that's going to be over our second volume, which is 1815, or 1.815, and over that first temperature of 310 Kelvin. Checking our units, Kelvin cancels, milliliters cancels. We're left with units of atmospheres. So we have in our calculator 293 times 15.1 times 2425 and then you're going to take all of that and you're going to divide it by 1815 and 310. Now guys here you should get 19.1 atmospheres. I have to tell you, um, make sure when you enter this in the calculator, you have this times this times this divided by this divided by this. If you're going to use multiplying, you need to tell it order of operations by including another set of parentheses, okay? Um, so if you're not getting the right answer in your calculator here, there's an issue with telling it order of operations. Oops, I didn't fix that typo. That's from the yes, the answer from a few slides ago. It's fine. Okay. So the last gas law, and I know you're probably thinking all this math, um, is Dalton's law of partial pressures. Dalton's law of partial pressures says that the pressure a gas exerts is going to be the same whether it is all by itself in a container or whether it is in a mixture of ga uh, uh, part of, uh, gases. So here we have oxygen, nitrogen, argon, water vapor, and CO2. Whether these gases are in individual containers or in a container of compressed air, you're going to get the same overall pressures, okay? Um, and so the partial pressure of each gas is the same, regardless of whether it's in a mixture or not. This is a great real world um, piece of knowledge because if you go scuba diving, um, 
they will take advantage of this when they give you a, um, a, a tank to use. Um, depending on the depth that you go to, you'll use either nitrox, trimix, oxygen, oh, look at that typo, um, or heliox. Um, now, guys, the problem with this is, I don't know if you've ever seen, um, there's a Cuba Gooding Jr. movie, I think it was called uh, Man of Honor a few years ago, which is a really good uh, showed a really good example of this. Um, scuba divers back in the day had this um, really old school uh, helmet where they had a tube that connected up to um, uh, the ship above. Okay, so that's my scuba diver. I know, you're blown away by my artistic talent. Now, the diver would breathe in the air from the from the ship and it would, they, they could breathe underwater. The problem is um, it turns out that nitrogen is incredibly soluble in your blood. And um, when you get down to low or very deep depths, the pressure builds. And so just like a soda, they pressurize your soda so that when you open a soda, all that gas escapes. The same thing happens if the diver comes from an area of high pressure down below the surface to a higher area where the pressure is lower. All the oxygen, I mean, excuse me, all the nitrogen in your blood um, starts to bubble out and leave your blood vessels, leave your blood cells and skin, and you get what's called the bends. Um, it's incredibly painful um, and in some cases lethal. Uh, so what divers do now is they adjust the mixture of gases that they breathe in uh, depending on the depth. And so I think um, oh, one of these two, I forget which, is basically just compressed air but with a little bit more oxygen than nitrogen. Um, they use oxygen at a very specific depth. It's very odd because oxygen, pure oxygen, is actually quite lethal as well um, <laughs> because you get kind of uh, loopy. You can't really function, um, which is not good. Um, but you can also use heliox. Heliox um, contains helium and oxygen. Oxygen so that you get the oxygen you need to survive. And then helium because helium is not as soluble in your blood. And so... Um, it's not as dangerous uh, for divers. It's not as likely to get, you're not as likely to get the bends. Now, keep in mind, though, when you go down, um, that you already have enough nitrogen in your blood that you have to be careful anyway. And so even if you're breathing something that doesn't contain nitrogen, you still are going to be, uh, take precautions. So if a gas is going to exert the same pressure regardless of whether it's by itself or not, we can find the individual pressures in a tank of a scuba, in a scuba tank and then add those together to get the overall pressure. So here we have 21 liters of oxygen gas, originally at 25 degrees Celsius and 1.75 atmospheres. And then we have 9.20 liters of atmosphere of helium, originally at 25 degrees Celsius, and 17.84 atmospheres. These are pumped into a new tank with a 10 liter uh, volume. Now, temperature is constant, so we don't need that. To look at pressure, we take 22.1 liters of oxygen, 1.75 atmospheres, and we pump that into a 10 liter tank. What law do we need to use for this? We've got V and P. 22.1, 1.75, and a new 10 liter tank. Hopefully you can remember that this is Boyle's law, and so we're gonna say P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2, and we can just plug this in here. 
So we have 1.75 times 22.1 is equal to P2 times 10. Divide both sides by 10.0 liters. And our partial pressure of oxygen here is going to be 1.75 times 22.1 divided by 10. And you get something like 3.87 atmospheres of oxygen. Now for helium, we used red. For helium, we have the same information, V and P. So it's again going to be a Boyle's Law problem. So we have 10 liter tank that we pumped in 9.20 liters at, that was at 17.84 atmospheres. So when we set up this problem, we have again P1 V1 is equal to P2 V2. And we're going to have 9.20 times 17.84 is equal to P2, or the pressure of helium, times that 10 liter tank. To get P by itself, we're going to divide both sides by 10. And the partial pressure of helium is going to be um, 9.20 times 17.84, and then divided by 10. And you should get something like 16.4 one atmospheres. Total pressure is just going to be the pressure of oxygen plus the pressure of helium is going to be equal to the total pressure. So we're going to add these two things together. Oops, it was supposed to be green. And so you get something like, to carry the one, um, 20.28 atmospheres or 20.3 atmospheres. Um, believe it or not, this is actually pretty accurate in terms of the mixture of heliox. I tried to do a little research before I came up with some numbers. Um, but anyway, hopefully this helps you understand the gas law.